All right, so today we have Sebastian Rauch. Tell us about symmetries and structures of N equals three asphalts. Take it away. All right, uh, well, I'd like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk. It's quite exciting for me. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, this recent work I did with uh, Iñaki Garcia at Siberia, my advisor, Ben Heidenreich, um, another of Ben's students, Muldrow Etheridge. Um, Iñaki, of course, is at Durham, and then the other three of us are at, at UMass. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about the symmetries and global structures of these n equals 3 uh, 4D SCFTs that are coming from this kind of fun, non-perturbative string construction. So the kind of the order of the talk is I'm going to start by reviewing what on earth S folds are, since they're they're quite new and I I don't think everyone is an expert on these. Um, then the next kind of key ingredient in this analysis is understanding why we can think of brains in string theory as being symmetry operators in field theory, uh, which is, again, a fairly new perspective. Uh, then with this kind of setting in place, I will talk about how we're actually going to compute the symmetries and global structures. And this is entirely controlled by the commutation relations of the uh, of the brains on the string theory side. So this is how we're going to access um, information about these uh, non-Lagrangian theories, um, is we're going to do everything holographically on the string theory side. Uh, so then from here, we can look at the n equals 4 case, where this is really a check of our methods, uh, because of course, the symmetries and structures of uh, n equals 4 super Yang mills theory is, is well understood. Um, and then we can talk about kind of the, the new results, which are the n equals 3 case. OK, so first I want to talk about what S folds are. Oh, and of course, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if something's unclear. So we should think of S folds, I claim, as a non perturbative generalization of oriented folds. So, oriented folds are, of course, uh, an object we all love in string theory, which um, are. I don't know how familiar the audience is with with oriented folds, um, but they're they're essentially um, a a, a Z2 quotient of space-time paired with an orientation reversing action. Um, so what I'm going to say is that instead of thinking of these oriental folds as you know a separate Z2 action on space-time with the action of world sheet parity omega, um, we're going to think of omega as living in the type 2b string theory self-duality group, SL2z. Um, so in particular, um, omega is equal to minus 1 in this SL2z. And so with this perspective in mind, um, we can associate a Z2 quotient of uh, the F-theory geometry to an oriented fold. So this way I can kind of, uh, I, I can put these two different transformations on equal footing and, and make it a fully geometric action. 
Uh, and so something to note, of course, is that minus one acts on the string coupling tau trivially because tau is in a projective representation of SL2Z. Um, and so we see that in this orientifold case, um, I don't have any restrictions on what my string coupling is. And so in this sense, orientifolds can be uh, a perturbative object in string theory. So then to generalize this construction, we're going to consider uh, ZK uh, actions. So in particular, I'm now going to be considering a ZK orbifold of space-time paired with some sort of uh, ZK quotient on the F-theory torus. Um, so this gives me some ZK acting on the 10D space-time paired with the action of some rho k in SL2z, where rho k is some, uh, some operator of order k. Um, so if we want this action to preserve um, supersymmetry, so in particular, at least uh, n equals 3 supersymmetry, what we're going to find is that um, the case of interest is going to be taking our 10D space time to be a product of some 4D space time times C3. And we're going to have ZK acting on C3 as uh, just a, a complex rotation in each coordinate. Um, so some sort of, you know, uh, three complex dimensional lens space type type thing. Um, and we're going to restrict k equals one, two, three, four, or six. Um, if I pick other values of k, I'm not going to, to preserve supersymmetry. So we see that when we when we act by this quotient of zi, we're going to have that our space-time now looks like m4 times this radial direction that I haven't touched. Uh, so that's the, the positive reals there. And then times this quotient of the, the five sphere. So this is, uh, I should say, this is topologically. Uh, when we introduce uh, D3 brains into this picture, then geometrically we're going to have something that's like ADS5 times this sphere quotient. Um, and so then here, the origin of, of this uh, positive real factor is this uh, fixed point of this quotient. And so that's the uh, generalization of the, of the O-plane to this S-fold picture. You have an additional action on the radius direction. Sorry? You, you have a, an action, the, the, the k's don't sum up to uh, one. So uh, you have an additional action on the radius direction. What I'm kind sorry? of action on, on S5 do you have? The, there is an action on S5, but there's also an action on R, R, uh, uh, R plus. Um, by the action that you defined, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I think I'm I'm being somewhat schematic in this in this decomposition. You you cannot write it like that. Right? The action is on both the S five and the R plus. It would wouldn't be an action on R plus if the sum of k's would be one, uh, zero mod k. But, uh, but you don't have this condition, so there is an action on R plus. And therefore you, can, you have to specify that, isn't it? Right. 
yeah no uh you you're correct um i haven't uh i haven't okay. specified that action yeah sorry Thank you. good okay um and then paired with with this um action on the space time geometry we're also going to have um, an associated action on the f-theory torus and so we can think of this as if I take um, some state, say a, a string, um, and I carry it around um, a cycle that's acted on by the by the zk. So I just think of that as as taking it around um, a cycle of the S five mod zk, and I have to act on this state by by this rho k element that I will specify now. Um, so what we have is that. Row, uh, row k's are specified as follows. So of course, if I'm not, if I'm kind of doing the, the trivial s fold, then row k is the identity. We've already seen that the orientifold case here is the, the case of k equals two. And then I additionally have these uh, forms for row three, row four, and row six. Good. So these are these are defining uh, these actions in the, the defining representation of SL2Z. Um, and so note that um, for K greater than two, row K, generically acts non-trivially on tau. And so for this geometry to, to be sensible, right? If I take a state and I transport it around and I come back to the same point in space-time, I should have the same string coupling. Uh, so this, this implies that we must, uh, I should say, pin tau to a row k fixed point. So in particular, we can take, say, how is e to the 2 pi i by k. Um, and so this is the sense in which these s folds are a non-perturbative generalization, uh, because here we see we've pinned how the imaginary part of tau to be order 1. Uh, so it, it's neither small coupling nor like dual to small coupling. Um, the other thing we notice is that um, because these uh, these row k act non-trivially on doublet states, we really must consider our states to be um, in representate like full representations of the SL two Z. Um, so. What that means is that we're going to work with objects like the D3 brain, which is a singlet under SL2Z, um, as well as things like the doublet of the F1 and the D1, or say the NS5 and the D5. Uh, and so we can't work in, for K greater than two, we can't work with say the F1 and the D1 independently. Uh, because if I take the F1 around a uh, one of these non-trivial cycles, then I'll come back to a state that includes a D1. So it's really these, these doublet states that are well-defined. Since, since you're uh, fixing the uh, uh, axiom as well as the coupling, uh, do you know of effects which um, have to do with this specific value of the axiom? Um, so, so you're you're asking if it matters if I pick say tau is e to the two pi i by three or e to the four pi i by three? Is that the question? Say for k equals three or that's that's one way. That's one way. I, I mean, there, there's some something. I mean, it seems like um, yeah. So you you say the argument about this thing coupling is that you, you lose perturbative. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Um, to uh, to answer part of that, um, the the choice of 
of which like row fixed point I take, um, I think doesn't matter uh, because at least in the case of say k equals three, um, I think those are actually the they represent the same point in the fundamental domain of SL two Z. Um, uh, so the, the, the would be you would say there is some kind of a symmetry which relates this value of the axiom to another. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but but I can't consider this geometry um, with uh, like a perturbative string coupling. Uh -huh. That's certainly true. Yeah, okay. Well, the, what I'm asking if there are any known effects in this part. Okay. So, thanks for the comments. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions about this uh, S fold setup? Uh, so in, in the analysis that will that will proceed um, is we're going to uh, place coincident uh, D three brains, so they'll be on the the fixed point of this uh, zk action. Um, so uh, we'll get a holographic setup that's kind of equivalent to the usual ADS five uh, cross S five uh, or ADS five cross RP five setup that gives you the super Yang Mills theories. Um, but here, uh, because we're only preserving n equals three supersymmetry, we're getting these non Lagrangian n equals three theories. Okay, so the next piece to talk about. is to explain this notion um, of, sorry, brains, not just as generic operators, but as symmetry operators. Um, and so this is, so of course I should say that uh, S-folds were first discovered by Inyaki and his collaborators, um, and then kind of better explored by Tachikawa and his collaborators. Um, and now this notion of in this holographic setup using brains as as the duels of symmetry operators again comes from from work from Inyaki, uh, but as well as from uh, Sakura, Schaefer Nemeki, and uh, her collaborators, as well as uh, Jonathan Heckman and and his collaborators, all have kind of contemporaneous work on this from last year. Um, okay, so. In, in the analysis that we're, we're doing, our goal is to understand the this generalized symmetries of these n equals three theories. And so to do that, we need to understand what the, the bulk dual of topological operators are. So uh, it's been argued that that brains are really the, the object that we should consider here. So kind of the first clue that brains are dual to topological operators follows from the fact that um, brains parallel to the boundary of space-time So I can think of this as this D M five when I have the S five mod Z K in this, this other space. Um, so brains which are like parallel to the boundary of space time become topological as they're pushed to the boundary. Um, and this follows from the fact that as we push objects uh, to the boundary of this ADS5, we're essentially running uh, a renormalization flow on them. And so we're pushing these brains into the UV where asymptotic freedom takes over. So the, the sketch of this is that 
if I have my nice ADS space, and if I have a brain lying on the boundary of this space time, that's a topological excitation. And this is in contrast to if I have a brain whose boundary lies along the boundary of space time. In this case, um, I'm not. I don't have this this RG flow, and so the the boundary actually is dual to a, a dynamical operator in the uh, in the dual theory. So we have that green is topological, and this blue brain is dynamical. Um, some some further data that we have is, of course, if I have some brain linking another brain, then if I like think of this as a, as a bound state or I fuse one brain onto another um, in the right settings, I can think of this as as the brain essentially measuring um, the charge. Of the other one, so this it comes from like the West Zoom mean of interactions. Uh, we have that the the brains can see the the charges sourced by other charges, and so this looks like um, in this topological setting, this looks like the topological linking that we that we expect from symmetry operators. Good. So um, these are kind of the, the main clues that go together. We also, of course, uh, can control what happens when I take, um, say, parallel fusions of brains. And you know, this will give me some sort of bound state that um, we can think of as this kind of uh, product law. Or um, in some settings, of course, it, it gives us some fun fusion law that is is non uh, group like um, and so uh, in Yaki's paper from from August has some nice examples of this in explicit settings if you want to look at those I can give you the reference at, after um, but so the, these are kind of the the heuristic arguments for why uh, these brains will become uh, the the dual objects to symmetry operators So to kind of summarize what we've done is that we've we've translated um, computing symmetries to uh, computing brain commutation relations. So. In, uh, sorry, go ahead. In in the um, in the in the symbolic picture of red and blue going to purple, the uh, so is it um, uh, crucial to to look at the transfer space? You can take two points and fuse them. Yeah. So I'm I'm thinking of this fusion, especially. We should think of as happening on. Or, or near the the asymptotic boundary, and so there I have two parallel brains that I'm uh, like forming a bound state with. And if I kind of zoom out, I'll have this equivalent picture um, in terms of some other brain. And you have some rules of um, how these brains should, um, uh, what, what shape they have, and what kind yeah. Of so the um, yeah. So the they should be they should be wrapping the same cycle like in this picture. Um, I don't want to be fusing um, brains that are wrapping different cycles in some non-trivial way. Um, although it will come up uh, in this work that um, the wrappings on the internal space uh, can be distinct from each other, so we can make sense of, of fusions where the the internal space dynamics are, are perhaps a bit funny. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a lot of this work um, is nicely explained in Witten's paper on uh, ADS-CFT and topological field theory. Um, so he 
he looks at um, these kinds of, of brain fusions explicitly. And so you can see in some settings uh, where D5 brains fuse together and leave uh, F1 strings. Mm -hmm. I see. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, good. So the in the usual way that understanding what symmetries we have in our theory um, is controlled by how the symmetry operators, like what the commutation relations of the symmetry operators are. Um, here, um, we need to compute the commutation relations uh, for these brains. Um, but in particular, we need the commutation relations as we move to the asymptotic boundary. So uh, it's a slightly simpler problem than it might otherwise be, uh, because it's uh, governed by topological data. So now the plan is to describe how to explicitly do these, these commutation relation computations. Um, and then we'll we'll see how to how to interpret these. Okay. So the the other thing to notice, um, of course, is that the commutation relations of these brains are directly related to um, the consistent choices of boundary conditions in the string theory. Um, exactly because you need uh, mutually commuting, you need to specify data on a mutually commuting set of observables. Right in, in vanilla quantum mechanics, we can't specify both the position and momentum of a particle. We have to pick one or the other or some polarization. And so the same thing uh, will appear here where the commutation relations of the of the brains will will also tell us what boundary conditions we can have. And in that way, we'll see what the, the global structures uh, of these theories are. OK, so to compute these commutation relations, uh, we're going to pass to canonical quantization. And we're taking the uh, radial direction of M5 uh, to be our uh, you know, our, our time. We're, so we're taking a foliation with respect to that parameter, at least near the boundary where we're computing these commutation relations. Um, so this is where I had this. Um, so in, in the usual picture, this will be like the radius of uh, Euclidean ADS5. Um, but we can also think about putting these on, on slightly more exciting backgrounds where we'll be able to, to have where are these topological features uh, present? So, good. Okay, so kind of to to make the computations uh, more manageable, um, let's begin with the toy model of generalized Maxwell's. which is controlled by the action and the, the usual Maxwell action, except now I'm taking uh, my connection to be a K form instead of a one form. Um, so if you want, this is some sort of uh, a connection on a K bundle. And so it's some sort of, you know, a uh, K gerb. Um, although the, the exact details there won't be super important. Um, good, and uh, kind of to explain what this is a toy model of, this is a, a toy model of, say, uh, D1, D5 brain linking. Um, so there I would have uh, C2 um, would be like my fundamental variable that's uh, under which D1 is, is charged. So to kind of understand how we're doing this, um, two... Uh, CK, uh, we, okay, 
what the best way to say this. Um, so we can, of course, write down uh, charge measuring operators in the usual way. So I can measure the charge enclosed in some surface sigma. I code dimension k plus one. So this is the, the usual Gauss's law picture. Um, and as well, we can write down kind of the magnetic dual of this, where we have a uh, co-dimension d minus k uh, manifold and, and integrate uh, d c k. Um, what will be useful um, is to rewrite this um, in terms of, instead of this homological data sigma, we're going to write it in terms of cohomological data. Um, so we're going to write it in terms of now a K form and integrate it over the spatial geometry. So remember, we're doing this canonical quantizations. So that's why I've, I've lost a dimension here on my space. Um, and so I can wedge this form with uh, this, this my my uh, field strength with this uh, k form sigma var k or sorry var sigma k, uh, which is the uh, Poincaré dual. To sigma d minus k minus one, again, in this uh, spatial slice. Um, from here, of course, we can write down the unitary charge measuring operator, which is just the exponential. Um, and in general, um, I don't want to get fully into the notation here because uh, it, it gets a bit heady, but um, in general, I want to uh, lift uh, everything into differential cohomology. Um, this will just allow me to uh, fully specify all of the physical data in terms of, of just the differential cohomology, so I don't have to worry about this splitting of uh, flat connections um, and the, the local data. Um, so now, an important thing to ask is, we have this operator u alpha, but um, how does it act on the physical states? Um, to do this, we need to understand what our states are. And like I said, um, basically a, a basis for our Hilbert space will be given by this differential cohomology group. Um, so this is you know, a, a group which contains both this um, field strength data um, and kind of like the discrete holonomy data. So when I have uh, a non-trivial manifold, of course, I can have uh, interesting holonomy around cycles which don't have uh, any curvature associated to them. Um, and so we can write states governed by these elements of H check. Um, good, so any questions here? The, uh, the, the key feature here, and this is following um, work from Friedmar Siegel uh, on, on how to quantize these gauge theories. The, the, 
the key piece of info of of data here is the fact that this H check K plus one uh, it contains all of the the physical data for a pure gauge theory. Um, okay, then we also note. that um, CK is conjugate to this star DCK. If you want, um, uh, I have like two derivatives in the action, but I can put them kind of both on, on the star, star DCK and leave a uh, CK on the other side. And so I have this uh, canonical pairing. Um, so this tells me, immediately how u alpha should act on some state um, because it should just because of this uh, canonical conjugacy uh, it should just act by translation where here i have to use this lifting map iota which is lifting me from these uh closed cycles to, uh, so, yeah. Uh, the, um, the, the basis for the Hilbert space, can it be made uh, orthonormal? Uh, yes, so the, this basis, right, so if I pick um, like a set of generators for each check, um, that should, um, yeah, that should give me an orthonormal basis. I think you do have to be a little bit careful um, about um, torsion, right? Uh, uh, because there's no uh, canonical way to pull out the torsion part of mm -hmm. of a group. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful. But um, yeah, I, I think there's no problem there. So uh, in the dimension? So um, generically, this H check um, for the manifolds that we want to think about will, will be finite. And what kind of uh, structure will they have? Um, so the full collection of H check, um, I believe, is a graded um, ring. Um, there's, yeah, so Jigar Simon's differential cohomology is slightly confusing to work with. There's like nice uh, commutative pentagrams to, mm -hmm. pentagons, sorry, to work with. But um, yeah, mo most of the, the features that we like from like check cohomology do lift in a reasonable way. Let's see. But that's yeah. the technology that you need. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're using Cheeger Simon's differential cohomology to to do these computations. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So just to to understand if I understood correctly, so this H check K plus one, this is a finite group, and then you take so it has some order, and then the Hilbert space is just has dimension this order. Yes. You take uh, you take the the vector space. And... Yeah. So yeah. So in particular, in general, this H check um, won't contain Z factors, and so then, in particular, in that case, this um, this question of like how to pull out the torsion um, kind of doesn't complicate matters. Hmm. Okay, okay. So now we have a finite dimension of Hilbert space, and okay. Yeah, and so all of this is like very <laughs> kosher. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Um, and so. Just to, to kind of fully spell this out, this relationship here uh, is exactly the same as the usual picture in vanilla quantum mechanics, where uh, this variable p canonically conjugate to x generates translations in x. So we're doing just the exact same thing in this uh, slightly funny. Uh, discrete setting. Good, any questions? 
So then from here, uh, good. So we can define analogously this uh, magnetic charge operator, where here I'm actually going to leave it in terms of uh, homology cycles for reasons that should become clear in a second. Um, so this this is the operator which measures the magnetic charge enclosed instead of the electric charge. Um, so then we see immediately uh, what the commutation relation is. Uh, so I just get this kind of central factor um, in the in the algebra, which is what you would expect from this kind of canonical uh, relationship between the variables. Um, and in particular, we get this funny factor here, um, which is called the linking pairing. Um, and so this is related to how to pair Uh, these two surfaces uh, topologically. So we have to be a little bit careful. This map uh, iota, which is including our flat connections into differential cohomology, uh, can introduce uh, discrete factors so that we don't necessarily get an integral pairing. Um, and as we'll see, uh, we'll explicitly want to um, consider some like an additional splitting of M into our uh, bulk space time and an internal space time. And so kind of how we're treating the internal space will, will also enter. Um, so what is what is S here in the- oh, Sorry, this is the, the- It's a dual to- Bar sigma. sigma surface. So this is the surface SK is the Poincaré dual in MD minus one to- Sigma. Okay, and F in the definition of V beta, you have an F. Oh, sorry. This is the this is iota. This is. No, the... no, no. I mean, I mean, above the the line above, you have V oh, beta sorry. equals, uh, and here you have an F. Oh, that's this is supposed to be beta. Sorry. No, no, and after this, oh, sorry, in F. the interval. F. This is the. So this is uh, morally DCK. Ah, okay, okay. So that's the thing that is uh, in the action. Yes. So th yes. this is the yeah the the usual field strength um, plus the kind of discrete holonomy information. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, but so anyway, this what we have collected here um, is, as I was saying, a model of d one d five linking. Um, so I can associate uh, the U's and the V's to uh, D1s and D5s, respectively, in the case of K equals 2. Okay. So from here, there are uh, a few complications. In moving to the S fold case. Here you refer to the fact that D1 and D5 are dual objects, electric magnetic dual, or do you look at the system on the world volume of the five brain? Yeah, so if you look at the the system on yeah, so it's it comes from the um So th this is the generalized Maxwell is the term 
which connects the D1 to the D5. There is also the local system on the D5, like the West Amino term, um, which that's one of the, the complications I'm about to talk about. Um, that is uh, what is essential for the D5 NS5 pairing that we'll use. Um, it doesn't actually, uh, in this setting, uh, complicate the D1, D5 pairing. So when, when you write down the reaction, DC star DC, um, in how many dimensions? These are in 10? Yeah, so this is the, well, you would write down the full 10 dimensional action along with the, um, like West Amino Witten terms for the D brains. Yeah. And then run this argument in that more complex setting. Um, one of the complications there is you have to be careful about when you're using the modified field strengths. Um, but most of those issues uh, resolve themselves if you go to the, the M theory lift. Mm -hmm. Let's see. OK. Thank you. OK, so some complications uh, in the S-fold case. And these complications are actually distinct in the n equals 4 and n equals 3 case. So in the n equals 4 case, um, we have the Chern-Simons term. Which, um, if you're familiar at all with this kind of story in the uh, SUN super Yang Mills case. Um, actually, this turn Simons term gives you a pairing between the, um, the F1 and the D1. Don't commute up to a term that goes like N. Want N, the uh, the rank. Um, whereas in so this is for SUN. In the case of, say, S O N, um, we actually are going to find that F1 and D1 commute. Um, so there's there's a complication here where we have to figure out why the Orienta fold, which is taking us out of the uh, SUN story into these uh, BCD type um, algebras. Uh, completely kills the commutator. And so this is resolved by realizing that we must use uh, local coefficients when we're computing our uh, cohomology. We can't use the, the kind of regular global coefficients. Um, this is because the F1 and the D1 uh, pick up a sign under the action of the orientifold. Uh, so they're they're in these twisted coefficients, um, and so this will actually trivialize uh, this commutation relation. Um, additionally, as I was just asked about, there are these uh, West Amino Witten terms, um, and this again complicates the story and leads to a non-trivial D five and NS five pairing. Um, so those are the complications that come up in n equals four. In n equals three, the complications, uh, those two complications actually go away because we're forced to work with the doublet states. So I can't even write down a F1 D1 commutator. It just doesn't make sense. I can just write down like the string, string commutator. And that is, of course, uh, they commute. Uh, but in the n equals three case, we kind of have the uh, harder version of working with local coefficients uh, where we uh, need to consider actually these uh, cohomology groups uh, with coefficients in this row K module. Um, so this is the the beefed up version of of the local coefficients that we get in the orientifold case. Um, and so this is just to properly track the action of this uh, sl two z quotient on the states. Um, all 
Okay. Um, good. Any questions? Uh, any other questions on these complications? Okay. Um, another point that's worth noting is that uh, in all cases, um, categorical information uh, is, is non-trivial to access. So what I mean by this is um, both non-invertible symmetries and uh, like higher group symmetries are somewhat hard to diagnose in this setup um, because that's really related to the fusion structure of the brains, not the commutation structure. So that's kind of an additional piece of, of data that you need. If you want, this procedure will tell you what the uh, group-like pieces of the symmetry are and to kind of stitch those together into the full categorical information requires further analysis, uh, which hopefully uh, we'll all have a fun time learning about in the next talk. Um, okay, so good. Uh, so for here, we're trying to classify the zero and one form symmetries of these theories. Uh, so we need to understand what the two and three dimensional um, states in the theory are, right? So we need uh, like the strings and the and the two brains. So the the an important question is. what are the states? So before we ask what the commutation relations are, we should ask what the states are. And I see I am running slightly low on time, so I'll try and go fairly fast here. Um, so in this case, uh, in the case of, sorry, n equals four, uh, there is discrete torsion, which is um, essentially a, 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 a background Wilson line for the, the Z2 quotient that we took. Um, there's one for each of the uh, SL2Z, Z plus Z factors. And so whether or not we're allowed to wrap um, D5 brains on RP4, uh, because that will give us a string state. And NS5 brain on RP4, again, will give us a string state in the bulk or a D3 brain over RP3, which will give us a, um, a, a line, or like a, a, sorry, a particle in the bulk is controlled by these discrete torsion factors. Um, so we see that we need this RR torsion to be turned off to wrap the D5 brain, the NS5, or sorry, the theta NS has to be turned off to wrap the NS5 brain. And if either one is turned on, uh, we cannot wrap the D3 brain. Um, and so this will tell us that um, the choices of gauge algebra BN is related to theta RR equals zero, CN is associated with theta NS equals zero, and dn is actually related to both being zero. If you turn them both on, that gives you um, kind of the, the USP gauge algebra with a non-trivial theta angle. OK, um, so for the sake of time, I will summarize the results um, with this understanding of which brains are present and with the previous understanding of how to compute the commutation relations, we can compute the full set of commutation relations to find the collection of uh, allowed theories and the one form symmetries that would be associated to them. And we find complete agreement with um, the Arone Cyberg Tachikawa work. Um, including, uh, we can match the uh, SL2Z duality orbits. So you have the Monton and Olive duality orbits on the field theory side, and you have the string uh, SL2Z orbits 
and we show that they're in agreement with each other. Um, the, the notation you use here, theta, so for B, you say theta R is zero? Yes. Uh, what was the NS for B? Ah, so this, uh, so yeah, sorry, this should be theta NS not zero, theta R R not zero, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's a, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So it's the dual you, you're using here. So normally we would say that um, the the B would associate would be associated to non-zero R, and the C would be associated to non-zero NS. Uh, do I have my B and my C backwards? Uh <laughs> I might have my B and my C backwards. The when I have the D five brain, um, I should be in the S O odd case. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So then, then the D five is charged under Ramon Ramon, and not. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I have those swapped. I see. Okay. Yeah. It's. Um, you know, since those two algebras are dual, it's yeah, really it's to get confused. <laughs> so. Yeah, but yeah, okay. So to to be consistent, we'll we'll correct that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now to quickly summarize the n equals three results. Uh, so this previous stuff is uh, confirming that our our methods work. Um, uh, now <clears throat> we have to consider which SL2Z uh, representations we can have wrapped where. So this is controlled by the cohomology essentially of this S5 mod ZK. So the discrete torsion uh, was controlling what uh, cycles we could wrap before. Um, there is also discrete torsion in, that you can turn on in these S folds, um, but we restricted our analysis to the case where we turn off the discrete torsion. Um, there's no fundamental obstruction to understanding this with discrete torsion, um, but it, it complicates the, the computations. Um, so this group, uh, which is controlling which um, which cycles we can reduce brains on is given as follows. Where CK is the co-kernel of one minus rho K, and we can explicitly compute this without too much difficulty um, for the different k's. So in the first case here, we see that we still maintain this splitting of the SL2Z doublets, which is why we can talk about the F1 and the D1 separately and the NS5 and the D5 separately, um, whereas once we get to higher k, um, they mix non-trivially, and we, we're reduced to this, this single factor. Um, so then from here, we may compute the uh, string wrapped five brain. So that I'm labeling the strings by this uh, blackboard I and the wrapped five brains by this blackboard V, uh, so Roman numerals. Um, so this is these are brains which are wrapped down to uh, two cycles, bulk two cycles. So they're the same dimension as the strings, uh, and so these. Um, strings and wrapped five brains are going to be controlling the one form symmetries of the dual theory because there will be two dimensional operators. Um, and so 
in a analogous but harder computation to the toy example I gave. We find the linking pairing data results in this factor of one over the size of this CK. Um, so times the brain of course. Um, so in the case of the uh, k equals six s fold, we actually find that the string and the five brain states commute with each other. Um, well, for the the smaller k, they don't commute. Um, we can see again the k equals two case. Um, we can split up the string and the five brain states into their uh, respective doublets, and we'll recover the d1, d5, and the f1, ns5 commutators as as being this uh, up to a factor of a half, which we would expect. Um, there's a similar game you can play with wrapped d3 brains. Um, and there, that suggests, so the d3 brains imply that the zero form symmetry is the d3 brains wrapped on a one cycle will give me the three-dimensional operator generating the zero form symmetry um, looks like a, a zk symmetry. Good. Um, and then additionally from this information, uh, we can construct that uh, we, we can see that there are three theories for k equals three and four. So this is associated to picking the string, picking the five brain, or picking a bound state of the string in the five brain um, as your as your like fundamental uh, Wilson line. Or, or dionic line in general. Um, and then because everything commutes, there's only one theory for k equals six. Of course, this is um, explicitly in the uh, in the case without discrete torsion. So with discrete torsion, we have a different set of theories, or we expect there to be um, a, a different set of theories. What, what known uh, statements does this analysis uh, reproduce statements which are already known from the perturbative strain description? Um, so, well, so it, it fully reproduces the n equals four story of uh, Aroni Seiberg and Tachikawa. In the n equals three case, um, it's in agreement with, Certainly, it's in agreement with um, like Gabby Zafir's um, analysis of the n equals one theories in the same universality class. Um, yeah, there there was not a lot of known information on uh, the symmetries of these of these theories beforehand. Kind of the the counting of the number of theories, I think predicted by Tachikawa, and we're in agreement with that. Um, again, up to this uh, caveat that we did not analyze uh, turning on discrete torsion. So they, they were uh, um, counting possible types of theories? Yes. What was this analysis? Can you... Um, I don't have the reference number in front of me right now, but I can I can get that to you. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's, that. It's, the, sorry, it's beyond perturbative or perturbative. Um, I I believe it's a non-perturbative analysis as well. Um, I know that the um, Simone will be will be giving. Right, is it Simone that's giving the talk, Julius? Yeah. I will be will be giving a talk on um, their work, which is um, I don't know if perturbative is the the right word for it, but it's looking at at um, like PQ strings um, in this kind of so more of a, a geometric engineering kind of an approach to this, um, and their their results are in agreement with ours as well. Mm -hmm. um, this will be in two weeks. Yes.
Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm more asking of uh, the, um, so, you know, when, whenever you introduce a, a new formalism, you have to uh, first show that you reproduce all of the things that you knew before and then extend the way. Yeah, I'm just trying to gauge what is the um, information that you could uh, reproduce. Yeah, so we, we do reproduce, um, again, the, the N equals four case is where we really um, have have a good amount of, of data to check our methods against. Um, and again, we're, we're in agreement. Um, and we are in agreement with the, the small collection of, of results on these N equals three theories um, that exist, but, uh, but there, there's very little to compare against. Um, good. I guess I'll just finish up with some notes on, on some things that we want to, uh, further our analysis with. And so one of these is to, uh, from this perspective, uh, look at the case of discrete torsion. Uh, that's of course quite interesting. Um, there's also the question of what the full symmetry category is. Um, in principle, we, we have access to all of that information um, once we uh, do the, the brain fusion computations explicitly. Um, and so we're, we're working on that. Um, one other note is that the, while the collection of symmetries, of the, the, the known symmetries uh, in the n equals four case, the full categorical symmetries in all of the n equals four theories is also actually still uh, to my knowledge, is, is not yet fully known. Um, but the, to the extent that that we have uh, access to the kind of group-like pieces of that, we're in agreement. Um, but the exact SL2Z duality orbits, um, there are some some subtle statements that, that need to be checked carefully um, between our analysis and um, the field theory analysis. In particular, in the case of spin uh, 4k plus 2, the kind of like the direction of the SL2z orbit in, in one cycle depends on the parity of k. Um, and so this is actually a, a non-trivial statement uh, on the string theory side about how to pick uh, quadratic refinements in, in this homology computation. And so that uh, in particular, uh, it seems like an interesting uh, area to look into because it, it's giving a, a physical meaning to what a priori seems like like a non-physical choice. Good. Uh, that's that's what I have. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank Sebastian. We have more questions. Um, so yeah, one question. Good, great talk, by the way. And uh, about uh, the VAT uh, five brains. So in the case of uh, the orientifold, uh, we know that uh, when you wrap a five brain, uh, the five or NS5 on RP4, you get, uh, and you choose to let this brain then end on the formal boundary. This corresponds to, uh, say, a Wilson or Tooth line in Spinoza representation, right? So the version yeah. by Witten. So, in any question, you don't have uh, groups or representations, but uh, for example, you can go on a Coulomb branch and look at charges of uh, your lines. So my question is, do you have any uh, insight on uh, how you could tackle uh, the question of uh, uh, what are the charges uh, of your five brains or your one brains? Yeah, so essentially so, question. Yeah, no, good. Um, so I didn't, I did not uh, explain that uh, carefully to see how to, to see that in our analysis. Um, but that is actually exactly controlled by this commutation relation. Um, so if I let, say, the uh, wrapped five brain uh, be dual to the dynamical object on the field theory side, so I let the five strings boundary lie along the boundary of, of space time, um, then the consistent choice of, of boundary conditions is to take the um, string states to lie parallel to the boundary. And so these string states will be the operators which are measuring the charge of the five brain. 
Um, and this commutation relation is exactly computing uh, that charge linking. Um, and so you can see exactly that the uh, the five brain will be charged, say, one uh, under this uh, size of, of CK gauge group. So in like the K equals three case, the five brain will be charge one uh, under like a Z3 one form symmetry. Okay, that's, a, that's a really good question. Thank you. All right, may I ask you uh, some question, please? I seem to remember from your paper that uh, you pointed out that uh, the theory that correspond to the complex reflection group G333 has a non-trivial C3 one form symmetry, right? Um, is that in our paper? G K equal to three case. Uh, G three comma three comma three. This seems to be the highlight one, the one that has a uh, n equal to one Lagrangian that flows to. Yeah. So I certainly it was it was Inyaki who wrote that part of the paper. Um, if I remember the in the case of um, so the the kind of interesting symmetry features of the n equals one Lagrangian, um, I believe, are not expected to uh, survive at, when you flow to the uh, n equals three point. One form, yes, zero form, probably no. Uh, but okay. And anyway, uh, my question is that: Are there any more theory that has that you know that has? uh non-trivial one form symmetry um so yes so um all yeah just, um i think the case where you don't get the one form symmetry um is going to be the case uh with the discrete torsion turned on um, I think all of these theories uh, with discrete torsion turned off um, possess uh, essentially these like Z3 uh, and Z2 one form symmetries. Of course, the, the K equals six case um, does not possess uh, a one form symmetry, but. Okay. Do you know a complex refraction group corresponding to those? I do not know. Uh, my next question is, um, suppose that, you know, uh, do you know whether these uh, have a top anomaly? Can I gauge it? Um, so we analyzed the anomaly in the n equals four case, um, because again, that's a, that was a check of our theory. Um, I don't think we have um, any direct handle on the et hooft anomaly in, in this n equals three case. Um, but that's really an interesting question, but um, I, yeah, I don't I don't think we know how to do that immediately, or at least I don't, I, Inyaki might have ideas. Okay, thank you. What, what was the question on the complex reflection group? So from my understanding, Ong Tuan should probably answer this better than me. A large class of uh, n equal to three uh, was uh, um, basically specified by um, the moduli space and is turned out to be a quotient of a complex reflection group. Yes. Occupied by three number, G, P, Q, R. Mm -hmm. And one of the notable one that I seem to remember from uh, is, uh, uh, Lagrangian description given by Gabi was uh, G three comma three comma three. I remember this is a distinctive one because it has um, seem to have a C three non-trivial C three one form symmetry. I see. It's a um, yeah. So I I wanted to know whether in this um, among this known theory. 
uh, are there anything else that have non-trivial one form symmetry? Because this one was specified quite explicitly in the paper, but okay. Should we expect a non-trivial uh, one form symmetry if we have a corresponding complex reflection group? It takes like the form of uh, uh, G, P, uh, P, uh, let me think. So as long as you say G, P, Q, N, and the P, Q are not a co-prime, and in that case, should we expect that there's a one form symmetry? What are they? What are, what is it? So when P Q, when the first two parameter, they are not co-prime. Yes. What 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 uh, what is what form symmetry? G C D uh, greatest common divisor or what? Yeah, yeah. they have a common divisor. Yeah. G C D uh, P Q. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I I think so. I think uh, we should expect this. Why? Why is this? Um. I think it's written in like a touchy cover the description. Right? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, do we have more questions for Sebastian? All right, then I would say let's thank him again. I'll stop the recording.